This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Hello and welcome into today's episode of KCS and Update. I'm your host, Tucker Franklin, and I am pleased to be joined by Brett Coleman. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at DraftKings Sportsbook. Go check them out if you want some of the best odds, some of the best parlays, some of the best, a little bit of everything going on at DraftKings Sportsbook. Make sure you check them out. But Brett, how are you doing? It's been a minute since you've been on the podcast. I think we talked earlier in the summer, but uh, how's your summer been? I know you've been really busy uh, since we last stopped talking. Yeah, I'm I'm at the point in my career where my off season's busier than my actual football season because we have 40 podcast episodes that come out in the course of nine weeks covering every single team, every single division, doing like schematic deep dives, roster deep dives, you know, looking back on 2022, looking ahead to 2023, and doing that for the entire league uh, takes a a ridiculous amount of work that we did not prepare ourselves for. So <laughs> I, I think my regular season, honestly, is going to be my break, which it's funny because that's still probably a lot of hours a week, but less yeah. than I'm doing now. So I'm looking forward to it. Listen, I've been enjoying what you guys got going over there at bootleg football. I'm um, wearing the shirt. Shout out to, to you guys. We got your, oh, we got let's your helmet go. up there. Yeah, we got we got all kinds of bootleg stuff. You guys gave us a bunch of love in the, uh, in the Chiefs episode. You guys haven't listened to that Chiefs preview. Go listen to it. Some great statistical numbers, a great deep dive into the Chiefs. Uh, do a great job of kind of uh, kind of talking Chiefs. Uh, if you get tired of, you know, me and Maddie and Craig and Kent all talking about the Chiefs, go listen to Brett. Uh, go listen to the Bootleg Football Podcast. You need Jay do a really great job breaking it down. I really I really did enjoy it. I thought I thought it was a good breakdown. And we we try to be as objective as we possibly can for every single team, because, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, the numbers and the numbers and the film are the film. Uh, so, you know, even though I do work for the Chargers, like I still pick the Chiefs to win the division because I'd be a, an idiot not to. Right? right. Like the film is the film. The numbers are the numbers and, and Mahomes is Mahomes. So it's like I'm, I'm still objective about it, even though I'm you know I'm wearing a little bit of powder blue right now. Hey, uh, no, no fault of that. But uh, you were in the powder blue and that got me thinking about the quarterback series. Brett, have you seen the whole the whole thing? Have you seen the whole whole series? Uh, I have a flight out to Jersey tomorrow, so I was going to crush that on the flight because I haven't had a chance to do this week. But that's that's what I'm doing all, all through my red eye is watching quarterback. And they announced. I think Peyton Manning just said they got renewed for a season two. I believe I saw you had a tweet about uh, about who you want to see uh, as quarterback season two. I don't remember the names, but uh, who did you have on there? Uh, so I, I figured they're not going to do repeats, right? Um, for sure. I I would like to see Burrow as like the yeah I mean he's not the same as Mahomes but in terms of like here's another guy at the top of the mountain top of the sport you know what's it like to be the guy uh, and then I also want Geno on there to be like the, be really cool. the the Kirk analog of like an older quarterback who uh, you know has has not really gotten the respect that he deserves he's kind of having a career renaissance right now plus it's just a really cool personality. And then uh, I, I've heard that the Mariota storyline is – I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard this Mariota storyline is like very depressing. And so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would like the third one to be something a little bit more hopeful and uplifting. Uh, so I went with Bryce Young and see if they mm. can follow around a young guy who's getting kind of acclimated to the league. Uh, plus, again, I'm, I'm biased because I've been watching Bryce play since he was 16 because he went to my high school. So uh, sure. I, I would love to follow him even more in the NFL. That's really interesting. Yeah, the Marcus Mariota one. I know a lot of people have said Mar they think Mariota's a little boring in there. I didn't necessarily think he was boring. I just like felt bad for him as like it as it just yeah. like kept developing and and obviously I knew what happened. Like I knew that <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't end the season as a starting quarterback, right? Um, but to kind of go into like the decision making of him like stepping away from the team, getting the knee surgery, and it's just like Ah, that sucks. That just sucks yeah. to watch that happen in kind of, I say real time in air quotes, but it, it sucks to like watch that happen. And you do get more context to kind of his decision making and everything. But I think Kirk Cousins came out of this thing the, the big winner. Um, I, I know Patrick Mahomes, obviously, I don't think he had anything to really gain or lose by doing this. But like Kirk Cousins, I think a lot of people changed their opinion uh, on Kirk after this thing came out. Yeah, because everybody knows, you know, Pat's personality at this point like he's been all over tv every single week for five years right right yeah but we never really get to watch kirk like very rarely do we get to watch kirk so mm -hmm. uh you know kind of getting an inside look at at what what makes him him uh i think is is good for the average nfl fan that doesn't Absolutely. doesn't really get to ever see him talk even like most nfl 
and Paul fans don't even get to see Kirk do press conferences. So, right. um, yeah, I, I would like to see them kind of do that more for quarterbacks that maybe don't get a bunch of media attention outside of like debate shows yelling about their contract every year. Right. I, uh, I think I made it, I made a tweet when, when the, the news came out, I think it was awful announcing, had it out there that it was renewed for season two. I quote tweeted and I said, please God, let it be Jameis Winston. Um, I just want cameras <laughs> to follow around Jameis Winston is all that I really want. Um, maybe it might not be the most entertaining one, but I think that he could make it very entertaining if it's just Jameis Winston. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Jameis Winston and his personality and just some of uh, his quarterbacking is, is interesting, but he's just a fun player to watch for me personally. I saw a lot of people throwing out Baker Mayfield, you Ooh. know, kind of, oh, yeah, which that was a good one. I would, I would understand that too, but also like, I'm not a hundred percent confident that Baker's going to finish the year. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I, I would, I would prefer to see guys that like, I, I know for sure are going to start. The yeah. Other way. Kyle Trask will be knocking down that door for long. Um, <laughs> look, what a, what a quarterback situation out there, huh? They went from Tom Brady to Baker Mayfield and Kyle Trask. And Blaine to, Gabbert, by the way. They had Tom Brady and Blaine Gabbert. To now Caleb Williams. Back. You know, that's <laughs> to Caleb Williams. fingers crossed, baby. Uh, you know, hey, maybe Drake May. Who knows? Who knows will be the number one quarterback off the board. There's some buzz for old Drake now. Um, we don't have to get into the, the 2024 NFL draft quite yet. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Brent, I did want to talk to you about the Chiefs um, in 2023. But before we get to, like, 2023, what are, what was your overall takeaway from the Chiefs season last year? I thought you said, you guys said something really interesting on the podcast of like, you know, they, they weren't a perfect team, but, you know, they were the last team standing at the end of it all. And they kind of just like withheld everyone's best shot. It, it, how I can try to summarize the Chiefs and, and it, people have this image of what they are, right? Because they have the, the 2018, 2019, 2020 Chiefs in their head of like right. high flying vertical passing attack you know, uh, defense that couldn't stop a nosebleed. Everything's a shootout. You know, that that Rams Monday night game, like that's the image that everybody has mm -hmm. of the Chiefs, right? But they're really not that anymore. Now they are a ball control, dink and dunk passing game that, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts, you know, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. That's what they're prioritizing. And then like four times a game, they need Patrick Mahomes to just make a play and he'll do that. Right? right. And so they just kind of bleed you out slowly until they need to do the finishing blow. And that's what Mahomes is there for. Uh, but they're also a much better defensive team than, than I think they're giving credit for, especially with how much youth they had uh, on the defense last year. So I think that they're actually somewhat similar to the 49ers. Like their, their play calls are different. Um, and I would say like their their bread and butter concepts are different, but in terms of uh, the percentages of what they run and the areas of the field that they attack and um, overall that that kind of efficient ball control philosophy, yeah. like I would say that they're they're kind of sister teams to the 49ers in a lot of ways. Mm, that's a good comparison. I like that there. Uh, and, and I think it's really interesting when you talk about the evolution of this Chiefs offense. It went from uh, you got to take if you don't have the deep ball for Patrick Mahomes, if Patrick Mahomes doesn't have the deep ball, he wouldn't, you know, that's that was the narrative around him, take away the deep ball. And now this year it's like, oh, he's a yak merchant. He's he's uh, getting all this credit for yards after catch. And it's, well, it's just a fair thing that like Patrick Mahomes is not going to win in that conversation. But it's just interesting how much they've evolved offensively just on that side of the ball. Only 46% of their passing yards came through the air. The other mm. uh, 54 came after the catch, which was second or third in the league yeah. behind literally only the 49ers. Like they were right there with the 49ers. So like when I, when I say that like statistically their numbers were extremely similar, like they were, you know, yeah. uh, the one, the one major difference was like play action percentage. They were 24th in play action percentage. Um, but, you know, air yards percentage, again, they were right there with the 49ers. Uh, average depth of target was 8.7. That was only 19th in the league. Right. Um, you know, and I I, I want to stress that there's a difference between depth of target and yak percentage and everything like that and yards per attempt because their yards per attempt was still best in the league at 8.9. So just because they're attacking shorter areas of the field doesn't mean that they weren't getting chunks. They were just getting chunks in different 
ways because right. they emphasize after the catch. I, I think I saw I was trying to look this stat up. I don't know if I can't don't know off the top of my head, but it's like yards per touchdown that the Chiefs had this year was drastic drastically lower. It was like four yards or something per touchdown. Uh meaning that they were not having as many deep ball touchdowns. Now they didn't have the deep ball threat the same way as MVS isn't Tyreek Hill in, in that sense of the in that stretch mm-hmm. of the offense. And Juju's not that type of guy to go down and catch these deep balls. So they really had to adjust and change their offense. I think that's really um, encouraging for the Chiefs kind of in 2023 going into it. Uh, so let's start offensively uh, mm-hmm. when, when we're talking about the Chiefs offense. And I think the biggest storyline, I talked to Charles Goldman yesterday, kind of some of the big storylines heading into camp, but it's been a conversation all, well, since the Super Bowl got done, basically, about the Chiefs wide receiver room coming into this season. Uh, they miss out on DeAndre Hopkins. They don't sign some of the wide receivers that maybe – uh, fans anticipated them to sign, you could say. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster doesn't come back. Uh, that was kind of one of those things where you're thinking about, hey, maybe he can come back and sure up this wide receiver core. Brett, are you worried about the Chiefs wide receiving core after missing out on D-Hop and, and kind of seeing what they have on the roster right now? I mean, I feel like if I wasn't worried about it last year, right after they lost Tyreek, I have no wor- I have no uh, right to be worried about it now, right? Because right? they're, they're going to be doing the same stuff. Like, it's a lot of... Um, you know, using concepts to space out defenses and just give Pat these kind of like seven to 10 yard throwing windows, right? It, like you don't you don't need a supreme physical talent to do the type of passing game they want to do. You just need guys who can read defenses and get to the right spot at the right time. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they don't have guys who have physical talent like Kadarius Tony when he's at his best. Like we've seen him do some stuff physically that, that not many receivers can do, especially after the catch hence why they traded for him you know mvs does have some deep gas sky Moore uh, has flashed especially going back to college having some deep gas but yeah they don't they don't need a tyreek type anymore for sure. um it's nice to have but they're not relying on it um and, and so no I'm, I'm not necessarily concerned about it we would love for them to have like a true number one we would love for them to have deandre hopkins but even then, like, you know, I was going back as a quick aside, I was going back and watching Hopkins film um, from this last year in, in Arizona. And even then, like he's he's not what he was before. Like he is a different type of receiver now. He is a big yep. slot type receiver now. He's not somebody who's going to go stretch the field down the boundary anymore anyway. Like he doesn't have that type of gas. So for a team that has a bunch of slot types already of varying sizes and, and shapes with Tony and, uh, and even with Rasheed Rice, who we think is going to be a big slot, um, you know, Sky Moore can play in the slot MVS. If they want like a speed slot option, like they, they have a bunch of guys who can play inside already. So they don't necessarily yeah. need Hopkins. Uh, like I thought they did before. Um, and, and I think that they're going to be fine. I, I think if the Hopkins number wasn't 13 million a year, they would yeah. have been in on him. And we know they were in on him before. And then Odell got his contract and Hopkins was like, okay, well, I want that type of money. And the Chiefs were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we're not giving you that type of money. So yeah, like, I, I think that that really tells you what they think of Hopkins of like, you're Absolutely. not going to be a deep threat for us anyway. So we're not going to give you 13 million. Hmm. That's a good. That's a good way to think about it. And I know a lot of the the narrative going around on social media, at least, has been like DeAndre Hopkins was always a need, not or was always a want, not a need. Um, when it yeah. comes to uh, the the Chiefs receiving core, I'm a little apprehensive, probably just because there's a lot of unknown, and I think it's normal to be apprehensive about a lot of unknown. Uh, Kadarius Tony, I think you know when he's on the field, is a very special player, and he has the ability to make plays. Uh, Patrick Mahomes has waxed poetically about uh, him and his ability to make plays and and Rasheed Rice as well. They, they've been able to, to throw a little bit and get acclimated. But the thing that worries me most about Kadarius Tony has been kind of his health. I mean, that's the, his whole career kind of boils down to his health and staying on the field. I don't I think for me, it gets to a spot where if you're relying on Kadarius Tony to play a whole lot, that's where it gets a little shaky for me. Um, because in the past he hasn't really been able to stay on the field. I love Kadarius Tony, and I love to watch him play football. And when he has the ball in his hand, he's incredibly electric. I just don't want to bank on that guy being your wide receiver too. How I look at it is if we need a big play down the field, it's MVS. If we need volume and third down conversions, it's going to be Sky Moore. 
if we need somebody to make a holy shit type of play, it's Kadarius Tony. Like yeah. that's that's what this receiving core is. They all have their own special roles, right? Um, and and I think that can work, right? Uh, it, it I do think that there's some thinness there to the receiving core, so you have to hope that those top three to four guys stay healthy. But I I I do not think that in aggregate this is uh, this is as bad of a situation as people are making it out to be. Do you last thing before we well, before we throw the break? Do you have more confidence in the receiving core this year than you did last year? Now that I know the type of offensive philosophy they really want to lean into, I would say so. Because again, you don't you don't need Tyreek to run this type of offense. It would be nice, but you don't need yeah. it. Uh, and I'm assuming that as long as Travis is Travis, like he's really the number one. Um, yeah. So like, it's not from a schematic perspective. Like, I get it. Like, I get what they're doing. And this is this does not mean that they're not going to make a trade for somebody. You know, in Absolutely. the first six weeks of the season, right? Because if they feel like hey, everything that we're doing last year, like everybody's everybody's squatting on it and they're daring us to throw it deeper uh, and we can't do that. Like if, if they feel like things are not going well, we could see them make a move. Yeah. Um, but as of right now, I, I think they're okay. Mm. That's Brett Coleman. I'm Tucker Franklin. We're going to take a break real quick. Thank you for listening to today's KCS and update. We'll be right back after this. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Entertain. Educate. Inform. KC Sports Network. We're talking Chiefs offense right now with Brett Coleman, a bootleg football podcast. Uh, many other hats that you wear, even that NFL one, though, which is my favorite, working for the L.A. Chargers as well. Got to bring it up every time we have Brett on. But uh, we're talking about the offense. Just got done talking wide receivers, which I think uh, is a big storyline. But I, th- what possibly could be a bigger storyline is what they do on the offensive line. Uh, when you talk mm-hmm. about they bring in Jawan Taylor. Uh, first, before we get into like the configuration, what are your thoughts on the Donovan Smith deal? I, I think it kind of caught a lot of us in Kansas City by surprise. It happening right after the draft. They get Wanya Morris in the draft, but then they also draft Donovan Smith. What were your thoughts on that signing? So somebody uh, in our comments brought up an interesting thing, and I, I, I want to know if you've heard anything about this. Hmm. Apparently, uh, the kid that, uh, that Jacksonville took in the draft um, – uh, Oklahoma Anton Harrison. Anton Harrison. Mm-hmm. Apparently the chiefs were huge on him and their plan was to take him uh, early and then they didn't get a chance to. And so then their pivot was moving Juwan back to right tackle and doing Donovan Smith at left tackle. But apparently the original like pie in the sky plan was pay Juwan Taylor 20 million a year, have him be the left draft Anton Harrison, have him be the right. And then mm. you got Nyang. Uh, Nyang is your backup, and, and who knows? Maybe Wanya Morris was like their mid-round backup plan with Donovan yeah. Smith, like already having a, a deal in place, right? But like that—that's what somebody in our comments brought up was that Anton Harrison yeah. was like the dude for them, uh, and that Donovan Smith was the pivot. That makes sense because I know that they had him in for a top thirty visit. Uh, I guess not technically top 30, uh, one of the 30 visits that they had. Um, and I know that they tried to trade up. That was a conversation that Brett Beach had in his pressers. That they tried to trade up and tried to go get up, but nobody let them up. You got to have two teams, yeah. obviously, that want to trade. So nobody would let them up uh, because obviously the <laughs> Chiefs knew who they wanted. Um, so that would make sense. I think Anton Harrison only went a couple spots before the Chiefs picked. Uh, it wouldn't have been a mm-hmm. very big trade up for the Chiefs. Uh, but I, that does make sense because they did have a visit with him, and that would have been a pretty nasty offensive line. I'm not going to lie. Uh, that would have been a pretty sick configuration. Uh, but to have – I think there's a lot of unknowns right now when it comes to Jawan Taylor, Donovan Smith, Wanya Morris, uh, throw Prince Tego and Ogo and Lucas Niang in there. You're trying to find the two best guys out of those five. Uh, and all Andy Reid's philosophy, Andy Heck's philosophy, has always been the five best guys. Put them out there. We're going to put the five best offensive linemen out there. Uh, well, I agree with that strategy wholeheartedly. It's going to be interesting to see where uh, Juwan Taylor ends up and where Donovan Smith ends up or if Wanya Morris rises to the top or uh, Lucas Niang ends up beating somebody out. They had enough trust in Lucas Niang to put him in the Super Bowl when Andrew Wiley was reported as eligible and then had to come out the next play. 
I think they scored a touchdown on that play, if I remember correctly. It's been a minute since I've seen the Super Bowl. But um, well, yeah, what I really wanted to ask your opinion on, by the way, was because okay. I don't think we've talked about it since it happened. When Orlando signed for only 16 a year, hmm. what was your immediate reaction to that? Because I feel like the Chiefs, if I don't know if that deal was available to the Chiefs, that might have been a deal that was only available to the Bengals uh, as as a as a screw you type thing. Because if 16 million a year for Orlando was on the table for left tackle, yeah. I think the Chiefs would have done that, right? Yeah, you you would think so. I I think. And they did sign Juwan Taylor before uh, he he came up with that deal. I think they had the Juwan Taylor deal kind of uh, dialed up. And you would have to think that they gave him a heads up that they were going to sign Juwan Taylor if he didn't take his deal that they had offered him. Um, and it is very interesting because he was signed on, what, like day four, day five of free agency. He was kind of a later signing uh, in free agency, later than I think a lot of people thought he was going to be. So I'm mm -hmm. curious if... That could be the only deal that he got. I don't know um, if he was holding out for that. Well, it, it's a very interesting um, situation, especially with him going to uh, to uh, Cincinnati, which I think I honestly think Cincinnati fits him so much better than Kansas City does. Like, I think he will be good yeah. for Cincinnati just because the way that offense is. And I know a lot of Chiefs fans got upset that he was saying that, like, Pat holds the ball too long. He, Pat holds the ball for a long time, but he makes some like special plays with it. So, like, you can't be too upset at him. But it is tough for an offensive lineman to hold a guy for a, a, a premier guy for three and a half, four seconds sometimes. So I do think yeah. that that offense in Cincinnati benefits him a whole lot better, will make him look a whole lot better uh, than it will in Kansas City. And I honestly wish him all the best of luck. I think he was great and he did, he did what he had to do in his time and he's got a ring uh, happy for him. Um, but no, it's a very interesting situation with how his free agency kind of, uh, you could maybe call it devolved over time um, as he went from, possibly being the highest paid tackle or wanting to be paid one of the highest paid tackles to getting a $16 million a year deal. Very interesting situation. Very interesting. I think, uh, I think it really just came down to since he would let him play left and maybe the other offers wouldn't. Right. Cause that's, that's important to him is he wants to play the same position as dad did. He wants to be a left tackle. So I, I think that that's, that's a, a pretty heavy influence there. I will, I will say the one thing he was wrong when talking about Pat, um, is he was saying that Pat's drop depth is too deep and that he doesn't give good angles for tackles. That used to be true like two years ago. Uh, no longer true. Pat Pat does Correct. not drop that deep anymore. So, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of copium from Orlando there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not, not a yeah. problem anymore, folks. Pat fixed that. He Honestly, it, and it seems like this happens a lot with Patrick Mahomes. Like, we could probably record a whole 50-minute podcast about just, like, talking about how awesome Patrick Mahomes is. But, like, if there's, like, a little thing in his game, right, like the drifting back too deep, he fixes it. Like, it, that's one thing yeah. that, like, his mental acuity has gone in a whole lot, and that's why I like about the quarterback series. You get to see him kind of develop that mental acuity and and his ability to break down things and process. It's, it's, it's at a different level. But his ability to, you know, change his footwork when he needs to. Like, one of the plays that they showed was when he hurt his ankle, and I can remember – we did a breakdown play with Matt Castle and Matt Hamilton uh, of this, where he threw off of his left foot. He generated power off of his front foot to throw the touchdown to MVS, um, which is insane, by the way. You're like physically, how do you do that? Um, but we just By growing up playing about, baseball, that's how. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, that, uh, they talk about that a whole lot in quarterback too. But um, we just went from talking about the offensive line to talking about how great Patrick Mahomes is. We could probably do any topic and then just transition into how great Patrick Mahomes is. But um, no, I'm really interested in this offensive line and how it works out. I know they kind of started off with Donovan Smith at left tackle and Juwan Taylor back at right tackle. A lot of people's gripe is his contract for Juwan Taylor, which like at this point, it's semantics. I think uh, you're arguing yeah. about a contract that doesn't truthfully, it doesn't really matter. It's not my money, so I'm not going to be upset about it. Uh, I know he'll be the highest paid right tackle if he does take the field at right tackle, but I don't really care about that. Joe Tooney was the highest paid left guard. Um, and that's, and, and, and you have to look at the total number of dollars committed to just the tackle position period, right? Cause if yeah, Donovan yeah. Smith is making not a lot and John Taylor's making a lot, you're still probably averaging out to like average tackle money yeah. relative to the rest of the league. So who cares? Right. Um, that's kind of, I'm a pioneer of who cares about contracts. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe that's a poor take on my part, but listen, it's not my money. So I'm not going to be, not going to be stressing out about it. But, uh, last thing I want to get to on the offensive side of the ball, 
Uh, I think something that's very interesting is there's no fullback on this Kansas City Chiefs roster the first time, and I think the Andy Reid era, that they don't have a fullback. Anthony Sherman, obviously, the longtime fullback. Then they get Mike Burton, who is now a Denver Bronco. Uh, went intra, intra division uh, signing there. But the running back room is getting a little bit crowded, picking up a UDFA in Daenerys Prince. A uh, very big guy out of Tulsa. We got to see him uh, at, the, at the Shrine Bowl. Um, and he runs a lot like Isaiah Pacheco. It seems like the Chiefs are trying to build that kind of room with Isaiah Pacheco-esque type guys. Um, Isaiah Pacheco did start off uh, this this training, this rookie kind of session of of training camp before everyone gets there in the non-contact jersey. He did have shoulder, shoulder and hand surgery in the offseason. Uh, but what are your thoughts kind of with the Chiefs with no running or no fullback on the roster and a potential to maybe add another wide receiver as they got like, you know, Richie James, Justin Ross, John Ross, and uh, maybe they've got already got four tight ends. How do you think, kind of think the the roster configuration with running back, wide receiver, tight end, and they might probably take ten offensive linemen too, and could take three quarterbacks. It's it's a very interesting case. I had a conversation about Charles Goldman with it yesterday of what they do on the offensive side of the ball, especially with those position groups and running back specifically. Yeah, and the one thing I want to emphasize, and I actually did a, an episode on this recently about you know, league wide last year was the first year in 17 years where uh, two back sets were used more than the previous year. Um, You know, you go back to early two thousands and like a 25% to a third of all offensive plays were two back sets. Right. And then it just went down and down and down until we bottomed down at like 7% a couple of years ago. And it's back up to like eight point something percent now. Yeah. That being said, that doesn't necessarily mean that all two back runs are run out of two back personnel. You look at the Rams using Ben Skoranek, who's a 230 pound wide receiver. He's their fullback. You look at the Falcons, even though they do have a fullback on the roster, sometimes they would, they would run 21 personnel runs out of 12 personnel by using Parker Hesse, a tight end as a fullback. Right. I think that the chiefs are going to do something like that. Uh, and they themselves were a very heavy outside zone team, just like Atlanta. Atlanta was first in outside zone. The Chiefs were seventh in outside zone. 60% of all their runs last year were either outside zone or inside zone. 35% of that being outside zone. So I think they're going to take a cue from Atlanta, who ran the ball on everybody. And um, a lot of, you know, running, uh, a lot of their outside zone type stuff from two back. <clears throat> they're just going to do from 12 or 13 personnel and use one of their tight ends as a fullback, whichever one they think can do that the best. Uh, you know, whether it's Noah Gray, whether it's Blake Bell, like I don't care, whoever, right? Yeah. W- they're going to convert some of these tight ends to being situational fullbacks so that they can do all their 12 personnel stuff, especially their 12 personnel passing game. They can do all their 13 personnel stuff, But pre-snap, they can get into a two-back run from that and screw up your run fits. Like, that's what they're going to do is try to go a little bit more positionless Mm. so that they can run everything in the playbook out of the same two to three personnel groupings. And if anything, what this tells me is that they want to quicken the pace, is, is they want to do a lot more no huddle stuff and just have a bunch of stuff they can run from 12 and 13 personnel and keep you on your heels. So... Even if it's still, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts, uh, the paper cuts are probably going to be coming a lot quicker this year. That's interesting. Uh, do you have numbers in front of you? How many times, like how, what the percentage of the Chiefs were in like 13 uh, heavy tied in personnel? Um, in I don't of have the exact numbers, but I know that like they, if we add up uh, 12 personnel and 13 personnel, like they were tops in the league. Like they did it more than yeah. anybody last year. Uh, okay. I don't have the exact, but like they loved having a lot oh, yeah. of tight ends on the field. And they've got a lot of tight ends that are incredibly versatile too. Like Jody Fortson ran like a, I, I think he ran a wheel route from the backfield last year. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like, and, and on a play that where Travis Kelsey scored a touchdown because he was running like a, a deep over or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but they had like Jody Fortson, Noah Gray and, uh, and Travis Kelsey on the field all at the same time running like very wide receiver, heavy routes that you wouldn't necessarily see tight ends or, uh, running, but I th- I think it's very interesting how much they do use that 13 personnel, and probably probably a good thing for this Chiefs. And and uh, I'm I'm just incredibly excited to see kind of like roster construction and how they how they take it 
because I think there's so many different paths for so many different guys to get on this 53 man. Uh, when it comes to running backs with the Derek Prince, I think a fourth running back wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing to have because running backs is a very position that uh, takes a lot of injuries. I wouldn't add it up. I believe it was last year running backs, starting running backs missed an average of three games uh, last year. So you're going to have, you're going to have a lot of running backs missing games. So why don't have a lot of running backs on your roster? I think that kind of makes sense to have four guys that you trust on there. Derek McKinnon, a guy that comes back who was very effective in the past game last year. I think he had nine <laughs> receiving touchdowns, which was more than Justin Jefferson. Let that sink in for a little bit. Yeah, um, well, he, he was their red zone guy. Him and yeah. Travis were the two red zone targets. It's nuts. It's incredible. But um, all right, Brett, we're going to get to the defensive side of the ball. But first, I got to take another break. It's our last break, and we'll be back talking defense and wrapping up this pod. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Entertain. Educate. Inform. KC Sports Network. Hanging out with Brett Coleman, talking some Chiefs here on KCS, an update presented by DraftKings. I'm Tucker Franklin. All right, Brett, let's get to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, the Chiefs made some pretty big moves in the free agency on the defensive side of the ball. I think it kind of took, I don't want to say took us by surprise. We had a lot of conversations in free agency about thinking, okay, the Chiefs will probably address offense and free agency defense in the draft so you can get younger on the defensive side of the ball. It made a little bit sense roster building wise, and they kind of did the opposite. Um, They addressed the defensive side of the ball uh, in free agency. So I want to ask you this question. What is, free agent do you think was more impactful will be more impactful this season charles amenahu or drew tranquil uh amenahu i i think um and that's just because of you know if you go back and you watch spags historically yeah. he's he's always liked having a guy who is not quite a full-time defensive end and not quite a full-time defensive tackle yeah and um you know, like, like the Justin Tucks of the world, right? Like mm-hmm. Charles Omenahu is going to be his new Justin Tuck. And I'm not saying that Omenahu is Justin Tuck, because uh, very few people are, but like he's not that far off. And I've always had a soft spot for him. Like when he was coming out of Texas and he was a day three pick, I was like, that is not a fifth round pick. And he has proven himself to be far better than most fifth round picks are. So yeah, I've always I've always really liked him. And, and everything that you saw him do uh, when he was with the Niners under Chris Kasurik, you know, where he would line up at like a two eye and then, uh, you know, he would just be stunting all over the place, whether he was setting stuff up for Nick Bosa or he was looping around the edge and being the contained guy. Like he just moves uh, so quickly that a lot of guards can't really keep up with that quickness. And he's so long and strong that when he's lined up at edge, he, he sets a really hard edge as well in the run game. So I think that he's going to be used as that classic Spagnolo inside outside guy where early downs he'll play outside, he'll stop the run. Late downs he'll play inside. He's slashing and stunting and looping and doing all the stuff that that you know Spags likes to do on third down. And he's going to be pretty darn good at it. And they got him for what like 8 million something like that, which in the yeah. current defensive line market is is ridiculous money for how good and versatile a player he is. I believe his contract, it was a multi-year deal, but it, it does work out to like about 8 million APY. I think it was, it would have been two years, 16, as what I believe it was off the yeah. top of my head. That's um, nothing. Yeah, I thought it was, a yeah, two years, 16 is what I was right. Man, I'm so smart. Um, <laughs> but I do think it's really, I think these two signings, I think Drew Tranquil is a very good signing as well for this defense. He had some versatility, adds a coverage guy to folks in LA or, I've seen a lot of people kind of a little upset that he's not back with the Chargers and he was he was yeah. pretty effective with the Chargers. I think he had like five sacks last year and uh, dude who flies all around the field. It seems like every time the Chiefs were playing the Chargers, they'd have a little swing pass out route, you know, to to the running back, a little leak. And then Drew Tranquil, boom, right there. Um, and you'd be like, man, who was that corner that just flew up? Oh, no, that was Drew Tranquil. Uh, came up to make that play. That's a linebacker. So I'm excited for him to see him do it. But yeah, to to get Spags another chess piece like Tranquil, like a Minihue, I think is a very fun thing uh, for this defensive line, for the defense as a whole. Um, but another thing I want to talk about is I thought you guys had some really good numbers on your guys' preview on the bootleg, bootleg football podcast of, of the Chiefs about Spags' blitzing last year was like almost non-existent. And when he did do it, it was like, well, Jerry, a sneed off of the edge. Uh, mm-hmm. And you brought up a good point on on that podcast about 
well, maybe it was because on the back end, there's a lot of rookies back there, a lot of young guys. Do you see that kind of defense evolving to being more uh, blitz heavy this year? I don't necessarily want to say blitz heavy, but Spags blitzing more because of these these guys have been able to come along a whole, a whole lot more. And do you think that's kind of how they take a step forward this season? Yeah, and I first of all, yes, I do think that they're going to blitz a lot more this year um, because I think the the coverage on the back end is going to be uh, – what's the word more communicative <laughs> if that's if, yeah. like built building on everything they did last year. Right. Cause last year um, they were like, they, they were just cover two all the time. Like they were third in the NFL and cover two um, didn't really run a whole lot of cover three ever. They actually ran more cover two than cover three. And I think they might be the only team in the NFL that did that. Oh, like most, most teams like cover three is by far their, their highest coverage. Chiefs only ran it 13.7% of the time, which is, nothing like that's pretty much we running it in base and like that's it stop yeah. the run right yeah. um but they ran cover two uh and quarter quarter half and like a, a bunch of quarters as well um and that's it can be kind of complicated it, it can it can be very complicated actually because they don't just run cover two and they don't just right in a quarter, quarter, half. Like, they are moving guys all over the place. They're rolling safeties. They're dropping corners. You know, the nickels mm-hmm. up the scrimmage, and all of a sudden he's 25 yards deep. Like, they do wild stuff on the back end. And that's a lot for young guys to take in. And, and I think Spags is like, okay, let's prioritize getting the coverage stuff down, like our drop seven coverages, all yeah. the different ways we run cover two, all the different ways we run quarter, quarter, half, or half, quarter, quarter all the different, you know, match quarters rules that we do. Let's get that down before we also start mixing in two deep fire zones, three deep fire zones, like all that crazy stuff. Like they, they had a few that they ran quite a bit, like I said, with Legereus, but that was typically just in short yardage situations because yeah. he would play the run on the way to the quarterback. They were seventh in blitz percentage in third and short at 47%. So they brought Legereus a lot in short yardage. But you go to third and medium, they were 15th. You go to third and long, they were 26th. So they they really did not emphasize bringing extra pressure in longer downs and distances because they just they didn't want to put too much on the young guys with a bunch of also added space. Like if we're sending five or six bodies, guess what? We have more space to handle in the back end. Yeah. Harder to do that with young guys that aren't quite, you know, picking up picking up the rules of how they run their stuff yet. So I think they were focusing on let's get all the rush for drop seven stuff down this year. We can sprinkle in more pressures this year. Now that guys are experienced and in third and short, like it's still a Jerry Sneed time. Like that's still his thing. hundred percent. I am very excited to see how this defense kind of evolves this year, especially with the success that they had with the draft last year on the defensive side of the ball, the draft in, in general, but the defensive draft, I mean, that was a hit. I don't know. Brett, have you seen a draft like that? Uh, kind of getting off, but like a draft where like you're starting, I think it was seven rookies in the Super Bowl, like hitting that. Many <laughs> and they all on, play well. <laughs> and they, Right. Have you ever seen like, I don't, maybe I'm, I, my memory doesn't go back very far because I'm not necessarily a football historian when it comes to that stuff. But have you seen a draft class be that successful for a team that, was like won the Super Bowl because in the Super Bowl it was Karloftis, Watson, yep. Cook, McDuffie, Joshua Williams, I think. Right? Yeah. Was he in? The, was he playing in that game? He should have uh, been. Yeah. Chanel came in a little bit, if I recall correctly. Like yep. it was Pacheco a lot. And then Pacheco, the obviously, uh-huh. Sky Moore got got some snaps here and there. Yep. Um, like it's it's rare. It's yeah. rare. And I'm not saying like all these guys are going to be stars, but just to have like seven dudes be contributors as Wild. rookies and win a ring. Like, I, I don't know if that's ever happened before. It's it's really hard to get seven contributors in a class, let alone also a couple potential stars on top of that. Yeah, it was one of those things that it just feels like those are the draft classes you need with Patrick Mahomes, right? Just keep getting yeah. some young, <laughs> young talent. Just keep retooling the shelf that way. Uh, young, cheap talent. You can just make Patrick Mahomes happy however you want to. But um, I'm very interested by this defense, Brett. I've been overzealous with this defense probably. Um, I've called a, I think they have the potential to be a top five unit uh, in, in the league if everything goes right. I know that's a, that's a, that's a bit overzealous. 
but I think that it's not far out of the picture on paper when you look at what they have here with the versatility, with the linebacker room, the secondary taking a jump forward. The defensive line is a, is a, is one of those areas where I think maybe they could benefit from adding maybe a, a Carlos Dunlap back, maybe another veteran guy on, on the uh, D-line. What do you think about that? The big thing, you know, and, and if Dunlap still has pass rush juice, obviously I'd welcome back with open arms. Um, the big thing for them is they they got to figure out run defense. They were a little bit sure. soft up the middle, hence bringing in Keandre Coburn. Like mm -hmm. that was that was a huge reason why they made that pick. It was like let's get a three hundred thirty pound tree stump we can plop in there. Because again, they don't play a lot of middle field close coverages. It's all too high all the time. It's harder to yeah. stop the run from too high. You need guys that can just freaking win up front. So if we feel like our our starting four of Carlotta's Naughty Jones and Amenahu can stop the run, or you know, throwing in Coburn on top of there as well. Um, you know, not for Jones, but probably for Naughty a little bit. Then we're good because they were 19th in EPA per play allowed against the run last year. Like they, that was like the one thing where it's kind of like, oh, my God, we got to fix that. Yeah. But if they do fix that, if they are able to stop the run from all the cover two and all the quarters and all the quarter quarter half they run there's not really a whole lot left to fix because on paper, you know, the pass rush again with Jones and Amenahu, you know, bringing in Felix Karloftis, you know, we have high hopes for like on paper, their four man pass rush is actually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and then Legereus is a great blitzer. If we want to bring five Bolton mm -hmm. can blitz. If we want to bring five Willie gay tranquil, like they, they can all blitz too. So on paper, the pass rush is fine. The coverage is fine. It's just, can they not allow, five yards per carry against the Bengals running uh, duo and inside zone 35 right. times. Right. That's a big question. Uh, and obviously, you know, Derek Nutty didn't have the best of seasons last year. He is back. Uh, I think that I'm very, we are very high on Keandre Coburn. I, I think you guys got to talk to him at the Shrine Bowl as well as, as us. Um, he is an incredible uh, human as well as an incredible football player. Uh, I love talking to him, love getting to know him. And if you look at like, if you go back on our YouTube channel and watch the video of Keandre Coburn, he sits down and he takes up like half the frame. He's a bit, he's a big dude. Uh, he, and, he is a monster, <laughs> straight up monster. It was, it was, it's very, it was very cool getting to know him and, and just hearing his story and everything like that. I was super excited. I mean, Craig was pounding the table for Keandre Coburn in round four. Like when day three mm -hmm. started, he's like, it'd be great to get Keandre Coburn at this next pick. And then they get him in, I believe, the sixth round. Uh, we've had Mike DeVito kind of break down some of his film. And he says, I don't know how this guy was a sixth round pick. Like I, looking at him, he said, he said, I have no idea how he felt at the sixth round. This seems like a guy who is uh, one of the first few nose tackles off the board. And it, it probably is the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of teams needing a nose tackle. And the teams that did need a nose tackle got like a Mozzie Smith. And uh, some guys that went a little bit earlier, but uh, that that need is not like you only have like one or two nose tackles on your team. But so but here's the thing: like. when when you need a nose tackle, you yeah. need a yeah. nose tackle, and the Chiefs needed one. Like let's they be did. real, they needed they one. Did. They did. Even with Derek Nutty back, they still do need a guy in there. I think it's good because you know the, the the trend on defense. I've said this a lot on a lot of podcasts. Is seemingly you know the Eagles did it. I think. I think the the Niners do it too, where they just like throw waves of guys at you. Like mm -hmm. they're they're platoon swapping on the defensive line every other drive. It seems like to keep those guys fresh and just to wear down the offensive line. It's a great strategy, and it, I don't. More teams are probably going to do it now when you see like the Eagles and how successful they were at doing it. Uh, but they better listen. They better play on a real grass though. They better play on a better field. They need they need the prime pristine playing conditions if they're going to be doing that. I saw man. They're still blaming that. I, it's like. What Come is going on? on? <laughs> Everybody so was playing bizarre. on it. Like both right. teams were on it. Like it, I don't know, man. I there's a lot. Let's be real. There's a lot the Eagles could complain about in that game. For sure. Yes. But the the turf problem was one of the only things that affected both teams equally. Correct. So like if you want to blame, you know, the the refs even you know letter of the law i get it like but if you want to blame the refs of like really you're going to call that in that spot there's at least an argument for that yeah. of like let the guys play don't blame the turf the chiefs are playing on it too they were slipping and sliding too and you know yeah. mahomes is on one leg on bad turf and you still couldn't catch him hobbling down the field so <laughs> i don't know don't blame that blame the fact that you couldn't stop patrick mahomes i can't remember who it was 
but they said that they thought Patrick Mahomes was faking being injured. Um, <laughs> to make them think that he was injured, he was faking it. No, uh, Pat- Patrick Mahomes is not faking being injured. He was injured. He's just also yeah. an absolute, unmitigated, unhinged psychopath. You're and correct. it doesn't matter if he's hurt. Like he's still gonna gut you, and, and I sw- yeah. like the the best quarterback in the league is Patrick Mahomes. The second best quarterback in the league is Patrick Mahomes on one leg. Like it, I'm sorry, it is what it is. I don't make the rules. It was quite a performance uh, from Patrick Mahomes in that Super Bowl. Hey, I might just go watch the Super Bowl again just because. Um, I remember when I was at the Super Bowl parade, uh, they were playing the Super Bowl like on the jumbotron, but they cut it off at halftime, and the Chiefs were down at ten and a half. I was like, why didn't you? Why didn't you play the good half? Before you play the second the, half. Just, the second <laughs> half. Just play. If you only had time for one half of football, just play the second one. Uh, that was the good one. Uh, but no, <laughs> uh, incredible game. And listen, I got a lot of respect for the Eagles. I think the Eagles might be one of my second favorite teams behind my Carolina Panthers. Um, but I, the, the excuses that they keep saying about like with the turf and uh, George Toma knew what he was doing and uh, he rigged it for the Chiefs and I get the con- the uh, the people being upset about the hold call but like there's a clear tug of the jersey there's a there's an out there's a stretch part of the jersey with a handful of jersey in it yeah and I think he took responsibility for like yeah I did hold him there technically like that is technically uh, illegal. But I, I think yeah. the thing that really pissed off Eagles fans was that, like, you know, he went on Twitter. He acknowledged, like, yeah, it's a penalty. Like, he was trying to tamp down everything so people didn't, you know, threaten the lives of the refs. Right. But then for Juju to, like, pour it on, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, dude, you won a Super Bowl. He acknowledged he did a penalty. Like, can we not? <laughs> can right. we not put salt right. in the wound? Now Eagles fans hate Chiefs forever. <laughs> it didn't have to be that way. No, yeah, that was that was a misstep by Juju on the put did a whole skit about it. Yeah. Uh for like and then he did it on something on Valentine's Day too. <sighs> what why do you have to do that? But no, it's it's been really interesting the the offseason discourse around the Chiefs. The Chiefs are uh, clearly the villain in the league now. It, there's no question about it. People hate the Chiefs. Uh Bengals fans will always be chirping. Uh the Bengals players apparently will always be chirping as well. Uh, when it comes to the Chiefs and that rivalry. So I'm super excited for that week 17 game. I'm glad they pushed it late uh, because I think that, you know, the NFL is not dumb. They know what they're doing uh, ratings wise with that one. But uh, is it weird that I I don't hate the Chiefs as well? A, I don't hate the Chiefs would be like I hated the Patriots dynasty. Yeah, I don't hate the Chiefs dynasty. It's probably because Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid are a lot more likable than Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. That's probably a big part of it. But like, I don't know. I I. Maybe it's because I'm older now, but I have such an appreciation for what you're, what we're watching right now. Where it's mm. like I know, like we might never see something like this again. Yeah. So like I'm just kind of like taking in the moment where like the Patriots dynasty was like, God, can they just be bad, please? Right. Like, can they let somebody else get primetime games? Like, no, I, I'm I want the Chiefs to get ten primetime games a year. I would watch them every single time. Yeah, Patrick Holmes is a lot more exciting than Tom Brady too. Um, maybe that's personal bias, but uh, I think this <laughs> the brand the, the brand of football that he plays is. Uh, a lot more exciting, but watching watching Tom Brady, this is a oh, sidebar, but watching Tom Brady in the pocket is like one of the things I'm just like, wow. He's he's actually really quick, like in the pocket moving around. Mm-hmm. Like you don't see think of him as like a quick quarterback, but just I think there were some clips that they showed of Tom Brady when they were when Patrick Mahomes was talking about like, yeah, I watched a lot of Brady because I needed to learn pocket presence better. Like I needed to yeah. learn how to be comfortable in the pocket. He watched a lot of Tom Brady and, it's, and they showed some clips. And I'm like, holy cow, I forgot how like good he was in the pocket with like new england like that dude could yeah. maneuver a pocket like nobody's business just like that four, four yard box he can stay in <laughs> to give him that box and he is set but uh <laughs> brad i appreciate you joining me on today's episode any final thoughts before i let you go uh i'm just excited for the season to get here uh you know obviously i'm gonna be spending a lot of time at sofi this year i'll be at yeah. the the chief charger game in la oh nice um because i i've I'm going to be spending most of my Sundays at SoFi, whether it's Chargers or Ram stuff. But uh, I I really want to try to find a way to come out to KC for a game in KC. Uh, who's who's probably the best home game that they got this year? I mean, they got Cincinnati at home, Week 17. Yeah, but that's like Christmas week, right? Oh, that could be. Or is it New Year's week? I don't know. That might be some, New Year's some week. non-holiday. Because I want to, speaking of holiday, uh, I want to go up to Ben Holiday. I actually have this bottle 
always at my desk. Um, that's good. That's like an hour outside the city. So I want to go up there. I want to catch yeah. a Chiefs game. I want to enjoy the tailgate because I've heard it smells amazing in that parking mm-hmm. lot. I want to go to the distillery, pack as many bottles as I can to stay home. Yes. So I'm, I'm due for a good old KC trip here. Yeah, Sunday, December 31st is when the uh, Bengals. So that's New Year's Eve. Yeah, um, well, my, my wife's birthday is January 1st. So I don't think that's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably that's probably out of the question. Hey, they have Buffalo on the 10th of December. Um, Ooh, that'd be good. Uh, Philly on Monday. It's a Monday night game. It's November 20th against Philly. Right before Thanksgiving? Okay. Yeah. It's not, not terrible. Uh, but they've got a good home slate this year. I mean, outside of, like, I think the Lions game to open. I think we've had this conversation. I think is a sneaky good game. Um, oh yeah, that's a great game. Chicago, they have Chicago on the twenty fourth of September. Then you go on the road for two, and then they have Denver. This is uh, this is awful. I know I've said this pretty much on every podcast I can, but to go uh, Denver at home, L.A. at home, and then at Denver in that three week stretch is probably the worst thing the schedule makers have ever done. Why you're getting two home games and then? Well, no, you, I mean you play Denver twice in three weeks. Yeah, but it's Denver. You're going to win anyway. <laughs> Like, why, why are you stressing about Denver? You haven't lost to them in like eight years. You're fine. I know, but like, <laughs> you're Sean good. Dude, um, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I know. Uh, the, my, the Miami game would have been a good one to go to, but that's in Germany. So that's going to be a tough one to be in case. Yeah. You know, but that's probably your only, uh, the at SoFi was at, the at, stadium. Ask BJ to put that on the company card. You can go out to Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if we can swing it. But yeah, it sounds like Buffalo or Philadelphia might be your two. A Buffalo game's gonna be good, dude. The, the Chiefs don't beat Buffalo in the regular season, so um, yeah. But I got I got to come out. Guess what was it Q thirty nine? Is that what it's called out there? Q thirty nine, yeah, yeah, pretty good. I, I, have, I have a whole list of barbecue places I got to hit next time I'm out there, and Q39 I actually have to look at the the new airport too because I haven't seen that yet. Oh yeah, it is really neat oh. in there. Um, I really do like what they done with the with the airport. It looks like a real airport now. I know a lot of people um, didn't like them ditching the semicircles of happiness, but uh, <laughs> listen, it's a real airport now. I like what they've done with the place. Um, got a lot of cool stuff in there. But Brett, once again, thank you for joining us on today's KCS and update uh, preview in this season. I'm super excited. There's people out on the practice fields right now, and that gets me absolutely juiced, ready to go. Training camp first practice that fans can go to is July 23rd. Uh, that's on a Sunday, which is kind of weird. On a Sunday, it's a five dollar entry. Go check out uh, Chiefs.com if for uh, tickets for that. Get up to St. Joe if you can. It's a wonderful time to get out there, and this you get really good access to these players and, and kind of see how they work and see the foundation being built for hopefully another Super Bowl year for the Kansas City Chiefs. So for Brett Coleman, I'm Tucker Franklin. I'll talk to you guys next week. We'll see you later.